It looks like the United Auto Workers six-week strike is coming to an end. GM and the union have reportedly reached a tentative agreement on a -a four-and-a-half-year contract. Ford was the first of the big three to sign on, then Stellantis, which is essentially Chrysler, and GM was the holdout with the largest uh, number of workers, 146,000 UAW members working over at GM. That's one third of the UAW. Helping to make the transition to electric vehicles, GM has agreed to recognize the workers who make batteries. They are now going to be members of the United Auto Workers. The new contract generally gives workers a 25% salary bump over the course of the four and a half year contract and offers a 70% increase in starting wages, bringing it up to more than $30 an hour for your first year on the job. Ford said the strike cost the company more than a billion dollars. GM put it at a little under a billion. So maybe it's cheaper just to give in to the demands so the workers don't have to go on strike. Good job, President Biden. He helped negotiate this deal, and he marched with the UAW workers. After the deadliest mass shooting of the year, gun store owners in Maine say they have seen a significant jump in gun sales. Residents of Maine were ordered to shelter in place until the body of the alleged shooter was found, and it was leaving many fearful before they found the body that they would be powerless if he tried to enter their home. So a lot of them went out and bought guns for the first time. So let's do the math on this. A first-time gun buyer versus a weapons specialist with the Army Reserve. Yeah, a gun is going to keep you safe. You're going to win that. Good. Buy guns. That'll keep you safe. Rapidly sinking, and with Nikki Haley tying him in the latest Iowa poll, Governor Ron DeSantis was asked on Meet the Press why gun mortality rates in Florida have spiked ever since he became governor. A clear-headed Ron DeSantis, whose mind is never clouded by hatred for blacks or gays, said, quote, well, because you had COVID and all that stuff, Excess mortality. Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, Governor DeSantis, excess mortality, but not from COVID, from some of the most lax gun laws in America, which is why Florida has the 19th highest rate of gun violence in the country, costing Florida taxpayers close to a billion dollars a year. You know how many books you could ban with a billion dollars this year? The genius, Ron DeSantis, signed into law constitutional carry, which means anyone in Florida can carry a gun with them wherever, whenever they want to go, wherever, without a permit, don't need a permit. Because when I think of people who should be allowed to carry guns, no questions asked, eh, the first ones I think of, Floridians. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, promised that the right to an abortion will be enshrined into his nation's constitution. And as they say, as goes France, so goes Ohio. I don't really think they say that. Election day is November 7th, a week from today. And the big race to watch is Ohio, where voters will decide on a referendum on whether The right to an abortion should be enshrined into the Ohio state constitution. And if Ohio puts it in their constitution, you know what they say, as goes Ohio, so goes France. That's how I think it goes. I think that's the expression. As goes Ohio, so goes France. Now, Republicans try desperately to keep this measure off the ballot because It's popular. It's likely to win. Politically, we're told if this passes, it would serve as a positive bellwether for Democrats going into 2024. Politically speaking, okay, if abortion is enshrined into the Ohio Constitution uh, after this election cycle, then a sense of complacency might set in. And what will motivate the pro-choice Democrats 
to vote a year from now. Something to consider. Sherrod Brown is a Democrat running for re-election to the Senate in 2024. It probably would help more if abortion were on the ballot next year instead of this year. Unless all you care about is protecting a woman's right to choose. <laughs> I mean, if that's all you want, then have it enshrined into the Constitution now. Jenna Ellis is one of the 19 co-defendants in the Georgia election interference trial. Last week, she pled guilty and agreed to testify against Donald Trump. On Sunday, she thanked her supporters for their prayers and said she's going to keep the $216,000 she raised for her legal fees. I'm keeping it. Her attorney, Michael Melito, who created the Give, Send, Go page that raised all the money, told her supporters that Jenna's legal fees <laughs> far exceeded what she was able to raise, and she needs the money to pay him. Ah, okay, how does this work? Well, a portion of Melito's fees include arranging her plea deal, but most of what he billed her for was the labor-intensive work of setting up the Give, Send, Go page to pay his legal fees. The judge in Donald Trump's Washington, D.C. election interference trial decided late Sunday night to unfreeze a gag order reigning in the comments the former president is allowed to make about his upcoming March trial. He's under a gag order again, and he's violated it. Trump immediately took to social media and posted, quote, not constitutional, not constitutional. Is that the same constitution uh, that you told uh, Mike Pence that uh, it says in the constitution that you don't have to accept the electors from the states you don't want to? So that constitution that you say this isn't constitutional, you know, maybe just maybe. A gag order is what Trump needs, especially since he called Hamas over the weekend hummus, and he referred to Joe Biden as Barack Obama. The pressure of all these criminal trials and civil lawsuits must take its toll. Trump's speeches include more and more Biden-esque malapropisms these days, including not knowing which town in, o in Iowa he was speaking in front of. Watch this. This is fun. And a very big hello to a place where we've done very well. Sioux Falls. Thank you very much, Sioux Falls. And thank you. I was being told. No, it's Sioux City, not Sioux Falls. So Sioux City, let me ask you. So Sioux City, let me ask you. In his defense, Sioux City, Sioux Falls, come on. The Sioux City is what he also calls the Justice Department these days. The man's getting sued a lot. And then he screwed up again. Last week, he said Viktor Orban, the leader of Hungary, was from Turkey and said Hungary and Turkey sat on the border with Russia. Over the weekend, he made the same exact mistake about Hungary. He said, did anybody ever hear of Viktor Orban? He's the leader of Hungary. Hungary fronts on both Ukraine and Russia. No, you pig-headed moron, it doesn't border Russia. It does border Slovenia, where your soon-to-be ex-wife is from. And maybe that's why you confuse what Hungary borders up against. Russia, Ukraine, you're both, you're taking orders from both countries. Trump's civil fraud trial enters its fifth week. And it's family week this week. It's family week. This is when it really starts to get good. In the next couple of days, we're going to be hearing from Don Jr., Don Sr., and unless she wins her appeal, and it's unlikely she will, Ivanka. Now, Ivanka was scheduled for this Friday, but they got a scheduling mix-up, and she's appealing, so now it looks like she's scheduled to testify the following Wednesday, a week from tomorrow. But Don Jr. and Eric are scheduled for their I don't remembers and I can't recalls for this Wednesday. 
And then Donald Trump, who says he's sharper and smarter than Joe Biden, has a great memory. He's scheduled not being able to remember or recall next Monday. Next Monday is when he'll say, I don't remember and I can't recall. Let's go back to Ivanka. Business Insider reports that Ivanka Trump, in her testimony next week, must make a decision. Should I lie or incinerate myself along with the entire Trump organization? What will she do? Business Insider reports Ivanka was the point person on securing favorable loans from the Trump organization's top lender, Deutsche Bank, which the judge in this case has already ruled those loans were based on fraud. In the lawsuit's original filing two years ago, New York State Attorney General Letitia James wrote, quote, Ms. Trump caused misleading financial statements to be submitted to Deutsche Bank and the federal government, unquote. Ivanka theoretically could face charges of defrauding the government since she served as the point person in securing the lease from the General Services Administration for the old post office building in Washington, D.C. to become a Trump hotel. A letter she wrote to the General Services Administration released by the New York State Attorney General's office suggests in this letter she submitted phony financials to the federal government. And since other companies were bidding for this lease, it could hopefully open Ivanka up to charges of defrauding the United States government. Mike Pence announced he's suspending his campaign after finally coming to the realization that Trump supporters want to suspend him from a rope with a noose around his neck. Yes, Mike Pence announced it's time to hang it up. After making the announcement, Pence drew audible gasps from the crowd who were shocked that he was even a candidate. They had no idea. In suspending his presidential campaign, Mike Pence said, this is not my time. I got news for you, Torquemada. Even the Inquisition wasn't your time. Your old news, Mike. There's a new Mike in town, Mike. And she's much younger and uglier inside. And her name is Mike Johnson. Both Mikes are in denial. Mike Johnson about the 2020 presidential election and Mike Pence about how Hugh Jackman and Kate and Leopold make him feel down underneath his pants. Pence is considered by some to be one of the heroes of January 6th. That's how low the bar is for Republicans these days. You're considered heroic simply for not going along with a fascist takeover of our government. You're listening to The Mop Up for October 31st, 2023. I'm David Feldman. We're conducting a poll in our live chat room right now. It's a very simple question. Mike Pence is worse than Mike Johnson, worse than Ron DeSantis, or three, man, (laughs) is James Corden insufferable. Those are the three choices in this poll about Mike Pence. So if you're watching us live on YouTube in the chat room, please participate. The question is, Mike Pence is A, worse than Mike Johnson, B, worse than Ron DeSantis, C, man, James Corden is insufferable. Please like this video, please share it, tell your friends, please leave a comment. I read all your comments, subscribe to my channel, and my newsletter. Jared Kushner said over the weekend, Saudi Arabia is safer for Jews than U.S. college campuses, but only if Saudi Arabia is trusting you with $2 billion of their money. Saudi Arabia is safer for Jews? Are you kidding me? It's not even safe for Saudi Arabians. President Joe Biden attempted to forgive hundreds of billions of dollars in student loan debts, but the Supreme Court earlier this year ruled that would make people happy, so you can't do it. But according to the Wall Street Journal, after the ruling, Biden ordered his staff 
to look for new ways to forgive some debt. And now it looks like so far Joe Biden has forgiven one hundred and twenty seven billion dollars worth of student debt. Turns out the Department of Education, it's an executive branch agency. It gives him permission to wipe out debt for nearly three point six million Americans. And yet his approval ratings are in the tank. More good news for Joe Biden and Asian Americans. Hate crimes against Asian Americans dropped 33 percent last year. That's because Republicans are attacking members of the LGBTQ community now and are too stupid to multitask. Can't do both at the same time because they're too stupid. Speaking of hate crimes, let's turn to the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who believes homosexuality should be criminalized and abortion is the reason people are shooting up our schools. He's Mike Johnson, and he's a self-righteous, moronic prick from Louisiana. Mike Johnson is turning out to be a prodigious fundraiser for the Republican Party. Politico reports that the National Republican Congressional Committee on Friday took in its biggest cash haul in nearly two years. They were thrilled. Donors are thrilled that Mike Johnson is the speaker by the end of the weekend In three days, his take was more than half a million dollars. Johnson flew to Las Vegas over the weekend to speak at that Republican Jewish coalition summit and met privately with donors. Jewish Republicans picked Las Vegas for the meeting because Vegas reminds them of the Israel Hamas war because it's a lot of unhappy people running around in sand, wasting money on something nobody stands a chance of winning. Johnson is expected to bring to the floor on Thursday a vote on a bill that strips the $14.5 billion from Joe Biden's $106 billion foreign aid supplemental and turns it into a single subject bill for Israel. Ted Cruz, along with other Senate Republicans, introduced a single subject Israel supplemental in the Senate last week. While Johnson now claims he supports funding for Ukraine, He's preventing Democrats from piggybacking Ukraine funding onto funding for Israel. Funding for Israel is popular with House Republicans. Funding for Ukraine, not so much. Now, remember, this is a supplemental. That means it has nothing to do with the 2024 budget, which has yet to be finalized. But uh, the 2024 budget, far from finished, uh, Johnson said he wants the funding for Israel to be offset by deeper spending cuts in next year's 2024 budget. This has never been done before when it comes to emergency funding bills. Punchbowl reports that Johnson is planning to pay for Israel aid by cutting roughly $14 billion that has been set aside for the Internal Revenue Service in last year's Inflation Reduction Act. In other words, how do we pay for Israel funding? By defunding the people who help us pay for it. In order to raise the debt ceiling in June, Biden agreed to lop a couple of billion off the $80 billion that the Inflation Reduction Act had already earmarked for the Internal Revenue Service to be spread out over the next 10 years. As Punchbowl reports, such a cut increases. When you cut the IRS, it increases. It does not decrease. It increases our debt. The Congressional Budget Office estimates a well-funded Internal Revenue Service would, over 10 years, shave hundreds of billions of dollars off our national debt. But Republicans don't care about debt. They only care about not paying taxes. Joe Manchin, the odious Democratic senator from West Virginia, West Virginia, one of the poorest states in America that takes more from the federal government than gives back. When Manchin was asked about slicing 14 billions out of the IRS's budget, he said, doesn't bother me. So who does he represent? West Virginia or the wealthy oil, gas and coal companies that don't want to be audited are forced to pay what they owe, because if they were forced to pay what they owe, 
his people in West Virginia would be doing a lot better, but he doesn't work for the people of West Virginia. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer responded to Speaker Johnson's new limited aid package that includes only Israel, and Schumer said it's imperative that the House and Senate pass the entire supplemental package as President Biden proposed it with aid to Israel, as well as Ukraine, the South Pacific, and also provide critical humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza. Senate Minority Leader Republican Mitch McConnell is not keen on Johnson's idea of severing Israel from this massive foreign aid supplemental that he, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden want passed. McConnell uh, supports funding for Ukraine, but is very much aware that uh, Republicans in his caucus support Putin and want Ukraine to lose. He fears allowing Republicans to vote a la carte on each country's funding. Uh, he, He fears giving them an a la carte option for fear it would leave Zelensky with less money or possibly nothing, nothing for Ukraine. Wisconsin Republican Senator Ron Johnson told Politico on Sunday that he talks with Republicans in the House all the time, and he says there's simply no appetite for funding the Ukrainian war effort. The House has no appetite for funding the Ukrainian war effort. Then he said, if Zelensky wants money, do what I did, marry the daughter of a multi-billionaire. He didn't say that, but he did do that. That's, that's how he became a job creator. McConnell brought the Ukrainian ambassador to his home state of Kentucky to stress the importance of funding the war against Russia. The closer he gets to retirement, McConnell, some say, is focusing now on his foreign policy legacy. Well, if it's any consolation, Moscow Mitch, you filled our judiciary, especially the Supreme Court, with anti-abortion, pro-gun lunatics, and that policy is as foreign as most Americans want to get. McConnell and Biden are pushing 106, the $106 billion foreign aid package as a jobs bill. Why? because Taiwan, Ukraine, and Israel buy weapons from American arms manufacturers. They're saying it right out in the open now. They're calling it a jobs bill. But Ohio Republican Senator J.D. Vance told Face the Nation on Sunday that he supports funding for Israel and Taiwan, but warned America lacks the industrial base capacity to fight a three-front war. What the F does that mean? He's trying to say our weapons manufacturers can't keep up with the demand. This is how a Yale-educated hedge fund manager hedges his bets. What he really wanted to say is, I'm rooting for Russia, and I don't want to help Ukraine succeed. Before Hamas's brutal October 7th attack, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was in America telling the House and Senate that without America's financial support, Ukraine will surely lose. President Biden and Zelensky have said Hamas is the perfect distraction that takes America's eye off the battle for Ukraine. Moscow last week welcomed Hamas and is forging ties with Hamas Moscow is calculating that the tougher things get for Israel, the less focused America will be on helping Ukraine. Mother Jones reports Speaker Mike Johnson taught a seminar on how America is a Christian nation. How's that, Speaker Johnson? Because we spend more money on weapons than we do on the poor? Is that why we're a Christian nation? Or is it because we allow hundreds of thousands to die each year from lack of health insurance in order to preserve the profit motive? Is that why we're a Christian nation? This week, Johnson has to deal with two resolutions, uh, one to censure Marjorie Taylor Greene and another to censure Rashida Tlaib, the only Palestinian-American 
who serves in Congress. And there's another resolution for George Santos's expulsion. Several key Republicans have indicated they will vote against Marjorie Taylor Greene's measure to censure Rashida Tlaib. And others have indicated you need two thirds to expel George Santos uh, from Congress. The votes may not be there. The House will also consider more sanctions on Iran, including its oil exports, to punish the Persian Gulf nation for funding Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. The bill would make it harder for Joe Biden to unfreeze roughly $6 billion in money owed to Iran in oil purchases made by South Korea. The Republican bill would demand that money be diverted instead towards victims of terrorism. Making the rounds of talk shows on Sunday, Speaker Mike Johnson said he wanted to go slowly on the Biden impeachment. He said, quote, we're the rule of law team. He said, Republicans, we're the rule of law team. We don't use this for political partisan games like the Democrats have done and did against Donald Trump twice. We're going to follow the law and follow the Constitution. He's all about the rule of law and the Constitution, which is why he insisted there was massive evidence of voter fraud after the 2020 presidential election, even though he couldn't produce a single shred of evidence. And he wanted Mike Pence not to certify for Joe Biden because he's all about the Constitution. He voted not to impeach Trump even after Trump supporters broke into the Capitol because he's all about the rule of law. So what if Trump's goons trash the office Mike Johnson's now sitting in while trying to find Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi to kill them. He's all about the rule of law. You can't impeach a guy over ordering his goons to kill Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi. As for subpoenaing Hunter Biden, Johnson said Hunter should be subpoenaed. I'm looking at that. You know, I I think that desperate times call for desperate measures, and that perhaps is overdue. Desperate times call for desperate measures? What times are so desperate that you would have to take desperate measures and subpoena Hunter Biden? What is so desperate besides your party's inability to govern and your desperate need for a sideshow to distract? So not even a full week into his speakership, where are we? Well, Johnson won the speakership because he's strong on the culture wars, strong on abortion, gun rights, same-sex marriage, gender-affirming care, no-fault divorces, homeschooling, and taking on the woke mob. That's why he won. He's a culture warrior. But right now in front of the House are the nuts and bolts of real non-culture war policies that must be addressed, like how to keep the government running, how do you pass a budget, and funding for our allies in Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine. There's no hiding behind religion, no moral certitude here. This is the hard work of making laws, the kind of work that divides even the people who take the same side when it comes to the culture wars. There's what Johnson really wants, says he wants, and what he can actually get from his fractious and deeply disturbed Republican caucus. So when you listen to Mike Johnson, you got to figure out, is he saying what he really wants? Uh, Says uh, he's pretending to want or what he can get from his caucus. Now, Johnson says he wants funding for Ukraine, but it's not what he said before becoming speaker. Now that he's speaker, Johnson's trying to align himself with the adults in the room like Biden, Schumer and McConnell. The fact that he's already severed Israel from Ukraine and Taiwan and will start the voting on a standalone supplemental for Israel on Thursday, that's the day after Congress returns, It suggests he knows it doesn't matter what he wants. 
He's not going to be able to get Republicans to give him funding for Ukraine. So get the funding for Israel passed and then try to tackle Ukraine separately, which looks like it would die in the House unless he does the unthinkable and reaches across the aisle to work with Democrats, something that would surely put his increasingly fragile speakership in peril. One of the reasons the House turned on Kevin McCarthy was his secret side deal with Joe Biden to fund Ukraine once they got the 2024 budget passed. So for those of you who think Russiagate was a myth and that Putin has no hold over Trump or the Republican Party, pay attention to how hard it's going to be to get a Ukraine supplemental out of this out of this House of Representatives. You have Republicans in this House who are rooting openly for Putin. But there are still people who dismiss Russiagate and the hold that Vladimir Putin has over the Republican Party. If you think Vladimir Putin doesn't have a hold over the Republican Party, I suggest you read the Mueller report. Read the Mueller report. <clears throat> so, while funding for Israel and Taiwan should find little to no resistance from Republicans in both houses, there is the issue of $60 billion for Ukraine that Schumer, Biden, and McConnell, Moscow Mitch, all want to get passed as soon as possible. But as usual... When it comes to Ukraine, the problem is the Putin-controlled Republicans in the House of Representatives. Yes, it goes all the way back to Crossfire Hurricane 2016. There is also talk that just days into his speakership, the honeymoon within Mike Johnson's caucus is over. And he's staring down the barrel of a government shutdown after November 17th. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh. <coughs> How long did that take? A half hour. I should have taken a break for water. <coughs> Hey, are you participating in the poll? If you're in our live chat room right now, please take part in the poll. The question is, now that Mike Pence has dropped out, Mike Pence is worse than Mike Johnson, worse than Ron DeSantis, or C, boy, James Corden is annoying. I don't know why that's the third option, but it is. Please like this episode. Please share it with your friends. Please subscribe to my channel and my newsletter. And of course, leave a comment. As you know, I read all your comments. Well, there's also talk that just days into his speakership, the honeymoon within Mike Johnson's Republican caucus is over and he's staring down the barrel of a government shutdown after November 17th when the continuing resolution, which he voted against, expires. He floated last week extending the continuing resolution until January 15th or even April 15th, <clears throat> but that's already getting pushback from people like Andy Biggs of Arizona, who said there are enough votes to tank any new continuing resolution that looks and smells like the one the government is operating under right now. We are now hearing talk that some Republicans give a November 17th government shutdown an 87% chance of taking place. Johnson is in short supply of experience, relationships, as well as the ability to dispense campaign cash to build the kind of power an influence it took people like McCarthy or even Steve Scalise years to accrue. This is a caucus of petty jealousies and personal grievances. That is basically, we've seen this, the Republican 
caucus in the House is just grievances and jealousy and slight, not policy. So it's safe to assume there's more than enough Republicans wanting him to fail and as an excuse to make him fail, they'll strike uh, an ideological pose. I mean, they, they just want him to fail, but they'll say, I, I can't go along with the Ukraine funding or this continuing resolution. No, we have to vacate the chair. By the way, they haven't fixed that rule yet. As I understand it, all it takes still one person who can file a motion to vacate the chair. I don't know how much longer Mike Johnson has. The 2024 budget was supposed to get passed on October 1st. It didn't. So the federal government is operating under a continuing resolution until November 17th. Now, we've gone over this before, but it's worth remembering. There are 12 separate appropriations bills that comprise the 2024 budget. If you get all 12 passed, then you have a budget. Sounds like a game show. The House passes the bills first, usually, then the Senate votes on them. But the Senate bill is not identical to the House version of the bill. So they go into a conference committee where a final appropriations bill is drafted for the Senate and the House to vote on. And they do that 12 times on 12 separate appropriations bills. It's a miracle we have a budget. Members of the House fly in on Wednesday after a much undeserved four-day weekend. Wednesday night, they will be asked to vote on three appropriations bills. The first bill funds the legislative branch. Well, <laughs> that one. There's anything they should be cutting, at least, well, anyway. And then there's Bill 2, which funds the Interior Department and the Environmental Protection Agencies. That's going to be a little tough to pass. And a third appropriations bill would fund the Department of Transportation and Housing and Urban Development. If they pass, that would mean the House has moved nine out of the 12 bills that make up the 2024 budget to the Senate, nine out of the 12. Uh, McCarthy was able to pass six. And if, if uh, Johnson succeeds tomorrow night, then the House will have moved nine out of the 12 appropriations bills to the Senate. Then comes the last three funding bills, which will be incredibly contentious. They save the hardest three appropriations bills for last. One bill is funding the Justice Department and the FBI. We have people like Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who say they want to defund the FBI and the Justice Department. The other bill would be the Financial Services and General Government Appropriations Act. It's an appropriations bill that includes several hot-button agencies like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which Republicans want to get rid of, the Federal Communications Commission, which the Republicans want to get rid of, the Federal Elections Commission, which Citizens United already got rid of, the Security and Exchange Commission, which the Republicans want to get rid of, the Small Business Administration, and the District of Columbia. We forget that part of our budget is funding the District of Columbia because it's not a state. It would be if it didn't have so many black people in it. But Republicans are never going to allow the District of Columbia to become a state with two senators because it's filled with black people. Wyoming... North Dakota, South Dakota, East Dakota, West Dakota, if those are actual places they say they are, they can get two senators. But the District of Columbia, where millions of people live, maybe, a mil I don't know, what is it, close to a million? But they're all black, can't turn that into a state. Nope. The third bill would be for funding the Departments of Labor, which the Republicans want to get rid of, Health and Human Services, which... 
the Republicans want to get rid of, and the Department of Education, which the Republicans want to get rid of. So these three last, they're saving that, the three last bills for the fire and brimstone. Let's turn to the war between Israel and Hamas. Israel, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, during a short press briefing, rejected calls for him to resign. He also rejected calls for a ceasefire. As evidence from Saturday's press conference, Benjamin Netanyahu's unity government is having a little trouble with the unity part. Netanyahu blamed Israel's security apparatus for the failures of October 7th. Then 24 hours later, he apologized for throwing them all under the bus. But because he's Benjamin Netanyahu, he still refuses to take any responsibility himself for the worst intelligence failure in the history of the country. Israel is divided. Half the country reportedly wants to focus on getting the hostages back, while the other half wants to focus instead on eliminating Hamas. The New York Times reports on Monday that some of the intelligence failures that led to the October 7th massacre can be traced to Israel, deciding a year ago to stop monitoring Hamas's communications on handheld devices. The Times says new reports reveal that Israel felt listening in would have been a waste of their time. Israel announced it has cut off funding to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, citing their sympathy with Hamas in Gaza. You're listening to The Mop-Up for October 31st, 2023. The Intercept reports that... 300 former Bernie Sanders presidential campaign workers have signed a letter urging the Vermont senator to call for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Sanders, according to The Intercept, has called for a cessation of aerial bombardment to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza, but he has not yet signed on to a ceasefire. The Intercept says during the previous war between Israel and Hamas, Bernie called Israel's response disproportionate. President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, on Monday condemned Israeli settlers in the West Bank conducting raids on innocent Palestinian settlers. Sullivan said, quote, well, we believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu does have a responsibility to rein in the extremist settlers on the West Bank who are as President Biden put it a few days ago, pouring fuel on the fire. And it is totally unacceptable to have extremist settler violence against innocent people in the West Bank. That is something that we will continue to press on. And finally, the Associated Press reports that since fighting broke out between Israel and Hamas and Gaza, Israeli settlers in the West Bank have killed more than seven innocent Palestinians. More than 100 Palestinians have been killed, mostly by Israeli soldiers, in the West Bank since fighting in Gaza began. Let's go to our poll and find out how people answered this question. Reports that since fighting... Okay, we have 552 votes. The question is, Mike Pence is, hang on, worse than Mike Johnson, worse than Ron DeSantis, or man, I despise James Corden. I don't know why uh, that question was asked. Uh, man, I despise James Corden. What does that have to do with Mike Pence? Well, coming in third... 21% say Mike Pence is worse than Ron DeSantis. 24%. <laughs> say he's worse than Mike Johnson. I love the chat room. And 55, <laughs> 55% say, man, I despise James Corden. Uh, yeah, 50, 570 votes. 56%. Top answer, more than a majority of my audience. 
went with man I despise James Gordon. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Please like this episode. Please comment. I read all your comments. Please share it with your friends and subscribe to my channel and my newsletter. I will see you all tomorrow.